arriving. Welcome everyone to our first advocacy day of 2024. This is the third advocacy day that the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers has done. And we are very, very excited for a day filled with learning and um, very grateful to be uh, having this in partnership with the Canadian Mental Health Association. We join together in advocacy. Let us begin first with a land acknowledgement, grounding ourselves in gratitude and uh, deeply grateful for the Mi'kmaq land-based values that inform our work. So wherever you're joining us from, perhaps take a moment to look outside or to close your eyes and think about a place where you feel especially connected to the land where you are. Um, if you want to take this moment to connect, whether it's a park, whether it's a garden, whether it is um, the, the beach, a uh, hiking trail, just a few moments of gratitude. And I also invite you to join with me in the chat and acknowledge the name of where you are joining from. So you can go to placenames.mapdev.ca and use the correct Indigenous name of where you are joining from. I would like to begin by acknowledging that I am speaking from Unamagi, which is located on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq whose inherent rights were recognized in the peace and friendship treaties that were signed with the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and Passamaquoddy peoples from 1725 to 1779. This series of treaties did not surrender Indigenous land, resources, or sovereignty to the British Empire, but instead established rules for an ongoing relationship between nations. The treaties were later reaffirmed by Canada in Section 35 of the Constitution Act in 1982, and they remain active to this day. Let us take this time to pause in reflection and gratitude for the land where we live and work. So please take a moment to put in the chat where you are joining from, placenames.mapdev.ca. We are all treaty people. So how does this impact what we do and how we do it and how will it guide our work together today? The Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada identified 94 calls to action with specific ones related to child welfare, health, justice, reconciliation, as well as education, language, and culture. And so we take this moment to reflect upon what truth and reconciliation really means for each of us and for the work that we do as social workers and healthcare providers. The Nova Scotia College of Social Workers commits to translating this acknowledgement into action by seeking to implement the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. We commit to doing what we can to becoming better treaty partners. We commit to learning and we commit to unlearning. We understand that decolonizing is a treaty responsibility as well as a pathway towards a safer Mi'kmaq for everyone. And we can see here that there are a lot of ideas that we can begin to dream about and talk about and plan for to begin decolonizing where we are here in Mi'kmaq and centering our children, centering healing, centering Indigenous ways of knowing and being is part of how we can fulfill our treaty responsibilities. And that's part of how we work towards healing the damage of colonization and harm that causes mental health harms for everyone. And we're really grateful to respected Mi'kmaq elder, Ella Paul of Millbrook First Nation for helping us to begin our conference. Um, we are having a few technical glitches right now um, because uh, of a few technical issues. Um, and so I just wanna take a moment to see whether Ella has been able to connect the sound yet. If not, we will perhaps continue and come back for that prayer. Okay. 
okay. So I'm I'm guessing that. Hi, can you okay. hear me? Okay, awesome. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's a wonderful miracle to start our day. So Ella, our beloved Ella, is um is uh, Mi'kmaq el elder and um, has been doing incredible work to um, bring into, to bring healing into her community. And um, so we are so grateful for you helping us start off in a good way. Um, so thank you so much for being here. No problem. I'm, um... I'm currently on the side of the highway here. I just dropped someone off to uh, detox. Anyway, and, this... and that is exactly it, right? That's exactly, that's exactly. Let's take a moment together. Um, let's just take a moment together because that's this is why we we adopted you as our beloved <laughs> elder because of the work that you're doing. This is what inspires us as social workers. The, you're you're starting us off in a good way, but you started off in a good way to begin with, right? Because you <laughs> are helping people through detox, through mental health challenges, and that's what today is. We need more resources, and that's what we're advocating for. And so, thank you for inspiring us and for everything that you do. Um, thank you. Okay, so you wish to open with the prayer. I'm going to open with the prayer, and then I'm going to have to sign off until I get home and uh, which would be about an hour and then I'll come back on. So anyway, yes, I want to give thanks to the creator today for, for everyone who is attending this meeting for today, especially I'm, I, I woke up this morning feeling kind of a little bit sad, uh, thinking about myself, uh, uh, I could leave that until later today. But anyway, today is my 48 years ago this morning at 7.05 in the morning. I watched my husband leave for the spirit world. He died when he was 29. I was, I had just turned 25. And I was thinking about it this morning. I'm thinking, I, I grieved that poor young woman I was. And I, I think of, you know, what would life have been like? But anyway... I give you thanks today for all of us. I give you thanks for the life that my husband did have, even though it was short. I give you thanks for all of you who who work with people who are are struggling. It's a hard road out there, harder for some than others, but everybody has a struggle of some kind. Um, I pray that the meeting turns out to be a good meeting and and I'll see you guys later. I have to get on the road. Nogama. Have a good conference. Um, Lalalan, so deeply grateful to you for the work that you're doing. And um, our, our thoughts and prayers are with you as you grieve your husband and um, honor his memory by bringing healing into this world. And we join with you in, in that prayer, in that commitment, recognizing the ways in which um, we still don't have like grief counseling available as part of mental health services here. Um, we need to rethink mm. our ideas of grief as um, we will hear in a few moments from one of our speakers. Um, but thank you for helping us start in a good way. And thank you for everything that you are doing to help make Mi'kma'ki a safer and healthier place for everyone. May our day of advocacy today align with your prayers and be the fulfillment of your prayers so that we can be part of our restorative justice um, to, to you and to your community and make Mi'kma'ki the healthy place that we pray for. Okay. I'll see you later. <laughs> I'll be back. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. And as we continue grateful for these words 
to help us begin. We're mindful of the ways in which we're mindful of the ways in which everyone is um, helping us in our own respective ways move forward in that healing journey. And we think about how the new Canadian Association of Social Work Ethics has um, required us to move to a place of advocacy, um, specifically because of the recognition that social work has not always been able to fulfill its values of social justice and that we need to be working to advocating for a safer world for everyone. Um, we commit to using our professional development to both learn new ways of thinking and understanding the work we do and to unlearn assumptions and bias so that we can insert a safer social work practice in a more just world for all people. We are grateful for the new CSW code of ethics that requires us to shift from the illusion of neutrality to actively becoming anti-racist and fighting against um, racism and intersectional prejudice that is part of colonization. <clears throat> it is, of course, also part of um, our commitment to honoring uh, those of African descent and um, our commitment to dismantling systemic racism, um, which is part of our quest to healing. And becoming anti-racist is a journey. Um, and it's one that involves moving from a place where we might be denying that racism even exists because we have so much fear to beginning to learn about racism and intersectional bias to eventually growing towards an understanding of our role in dismantling the systemic racism. Um, and so we take this moment to think about our own intersectionality. Safer social work practice means reflecting upon the ways that our positionality impacts what we do and how we experience the world around us. So we take this moment to reflect upon where we are in our own decolonizing journey. How are we integrating self-awareness and restorative justice into our work and into our professional development? Decolonizing ourselves and our practice means recognizing the ways in which we are each impacted by the colonial system in which we all participate and from which those of us of settler descent continue to benefit. Each of us, depending upon our social location and intersectional positionality, are uniquely impacted or oppressed. For example, those of us from African descent were dispossessed and uprooted from their land and brought to Turtle Island against their will as part of the white supremacy and slave trade that fueled the settlement of this continent. We take this moment to reflect upon the unique impact of colonization upon each of us and upon our practice. Because when we acknowledge the land, we must also begin to acknowledge the wisdom of this planet and align ourselves with its truths. So let us take this moment to pause in gratitude for all who can, who have, and continue to heroically care and advocate for this beautiful land. May we join them in this sacred work. So let's take a few moments to take a deep breath and center ourselves. Let us ground ourselves in the wisdom of the land-based Mi'kmaq teachings and values that we must all begin to learn. Let us work to decolonize ourselves, our practice, and this community that we share by working for justice for all living beings as an expression of our gratitude for being here. Let us take a deep breath and recenter ourselves away from the violent ways colonization fills our world and fills us. Let us take a deep breath and work on letting go of the unconscious bias that is everywhere, inside and out. May our session today lead us to be in right relationship with this land and with one another. And as we think about our quest for restorative practices um, and decolonizing ourselves, what this means is healing intergenerational trauma to understand the ways it has been passed down to us and internalized. Restorative processes can help us to heal because they integrate trauma-informed processes 
that recognize our shared wounds and focus on joining together with others to break down intersectional silos and unite to fix the colonial systems and intergenerational trauma we all inherited rather than pointing fingers. This is also the basis of just culture and safety principles. And this is part of why we are advocating together and joining together with the Canadian Mental Health Association and many different organizations in our advocacy efforts. It is also part of our repositioning social work practice and mental health in Nova Scotia report, which identified that 98% of social workers working in mental health believe that there needs to be changes and experience profound moral distress as a result of the current system that does not have the resources or supports available to enable us to provide the kind of safe social work practice which we believe we are called to do. And that involves shifting from a biomedical model to one that is biopsychosocial, spiritual, structural, that focuses upon all of the different ways in which we can each be healed. And so with that, um, our day is going to begin and our schedule for the day involves a panel um, and we also have letters of advocacy and a lot of things going on all day long. And throughout the day, there will be um, some prizes and we are grateful to partner with the Canadian Mental Health Association on those. And we're excited for this morning's panel. So having had a chance to begin in a good way, we're grateful for our speakers. We have um, Jacqueline Paul, who is um, going to start us off and who is the former chair of the Decolonizing Social Work Committee and who's gonna be talking about a call to decolonize health, bringing healing to mind, heart, spirit, and body within our community and our planet. And then we will have the executive director of the Canadian Association of Spiritual Care, John, is going to be speaking about spiritual care in the healthcare system and how that impacts everyone's mental health. Um, I'm very sorry to say that both Mobina and Terry Lewis both have had to cancel at the last minute. Neither um, Mobina is not feeling well and um, so let's take a moment just to send some love and light and positive thoughts and energy towards her that she can feel better. And um, we will have a chance to think about the importance of religious diversity for mental health and the role of wellness and spirituality and mental health in marginalized communities. Um, we'll take a moment to think about that in a few moments. Jordan uh, is going to be speaking from the Community-Based Research Center about the mental health concerns of those who've experienced adverse religious experiences and conversion therapy and what we need to think about in terms of specialized mental health services there. Yusuf is going to be speaking about creating an interfaith and intersectional alliance for mental health and well-being. And then Krista is going to be speaking about community-based initiatives to improving mental health. And finally, we will have a chance to hear from Karen Nichols, who is the Executive Director of Canadian Mental Health Association, and who is partnering with us on this Advocacy Day and hearing more about community outreach and fighting stigma around mental health. And so with that, I'm grateful to have everyone who is here. And we will begin with, um, with Jacqueline. And those of you who came last year will remember that uh, Jacqueline spoke last year um, at the our advocacy day and, and talked about the importance of rethinking our understanding of mental health. And in so many ways, um, her words continue to inform everything that I do um, in my own advocacy efforts. And uh, since we have yet to have achieved the world that she is dreaming about in these words, th this comment that she made last year um, is part of this advocacy day as well because we need to continue to advocate for a shift in how we think about mental health and that is part of decolonizing our healthcare system and so let us begin by listening to Jacqueline help us understand more about mental health and what we need to be thinking about. 
Hi everyone, my name is Jacqueline Paul and I am a Mi'kmaq social worker from Sebaganagati First Nation and I'm very honored to be here with you virtually today to discuss important topics such as culturally safe supports in mental health and death and dying from a Mi'kmaq perspective. Um, because of the time, I'm going to jump right into it. So I think we first have to be mindful about how hard it is to reach out for services and we all know that. But not only is it difficult to do so, um, with that being in mind, it's even more difficult when the message has been, you can't trust anyone. So when someone comes into your office and they tell you, I see and communicate with spirit, does your practice allow them to express themselves in a way without being labeled client is delusional. So this is a experience of a community member who had sought out help and when asked to read the notes from the session had seen this written down. And so that was the last time that they reached out for help and it immediately caused a shutdown. And so that experience is shared and it's told to someone else and what happens is sometimes people still do come for help but knowing that you're going to be judged or knowing that you have to hide pieces of you doesn't allow for us to build that therapeutic relationship that we need to start breaking through multi-layered traumas and so i really want us to just think about how we think about spirit and people presenting with that information. I also wanted to touch on uh, when it comes to death and dying from a Mi'kmaq perspective and experience and how we process death. Um, our communities, we all know each other. And not only do we just know each other in community, but we know each other in other communities. And so when other communities are hurting or have uh, someone pass, we grieve for them as well because we are moving together. We're seeing each other at Maui Um And so we experience a lot of death and how we have to be able to process that is a bit different. But we also know that our loved one has begun their next journey and that there is no end and how we will connect is through spirit, which was why I made the point about the counseling session. And if someone is presenting and say that, you know, spirit is important to them because it is really the essence of everything. We believe that everything has a spirit. When it comes to being in a hospital and there are policies around how many people can be present in the room during our family's uh, final moments, it really causes a lot of turmoil to have to identify who can be in the room, who is allowed to be present because everybody wants to be there. Um, and it's also uh, very difficult for us around policies, policies that say only family can visit because our lived experience, our version of family is so much broader. And um, so it doesn't always quite fit uh, for us. Also, we have come from really big families. Um, and when we're dealing with someone in their final moments or our family is in the ICU and we're being questioned, can all of these people actually be your uncles and aunts? They are. And to, to, to be in that position and to make feel like you're lying about that, it's just that extra layer of shame or burden that we bring to the space. Um, and so that's really difficult because we do have big families. Um, so not only is family just trying to gather and cope and process with what's going on, but we're away from home and we're away from community and we're looking to build that in an urban setting where smudging is never permitted and drumming is not allowed unless it's done outside um, and we rarely have access to an elder or a traditional person to send our loved one off in our own way. 
And I believe that this is a position that should be staffed um, permanently and 24 seven because people don't die between the hours of eight to four. And so not having that available um, is something that really sits with you. One last thing that I'd like to mention that Indigenous families uh, really struggle with is also the visiting hours. So that concept that you can't see your family but you can only see them between you know certain hours really feels inherently wrong. And I say this because you may or may not be aware of this cultural practice but when our loved one actually passes um, and starts their next journey. When we bring our loved one home, we wake them in our house and the community comes and pays their respects. And there's a sacred fire that's lit and it continues to burn and it's never alone, nor is our loved one in the home. Our family and friends stay with our loved one the entire time they are in our home. And so that's why I wanted to mention that we never ever leave them alone. And so the visiting hours is extremely difficult. Um, and we're hoping that we can start to have conversations about just being able to take space and be in the room, even if we're not allowed to say a word. It's more about that, that spiritual connection and staying with our loved one. Being together was together is really where we draw our strength from. We lean on each other um, to provide different types of support as any family does. But it's not meant to annoy staff or uh, create more work for a very hardworking, a very overwhelmed system. But we have to do better on bridging the gap between what exists, what is accessible, and what needs to happen around decolonize our thoughts around death and dying and people gathering. Um, I want to thank you for sharing this space with me and hearing me out from my own lived experiences. Lalin. So very grateful to um, Jacqueline for sharing some of uh, that perspective about Really, when we talk about mental health and it, this false divide between mental health, physical health, structural health, psychological health, spiritual health, they're all really part of a much larger whole. And unfortunately, we don't currently have systems that allow us to do that. Um, very excited that we have uh, John, who is the executive director of the Canadian Association of Spiritual Care. And um, I'll invite John to uh, turn on his camera and um, then I will be able to spotlight him. So John is um, here and is going to speak to us a little bit about really the role of chaplaincy in spiritual care. We heard um, a little bit from Jacqueline about why this matters in terms of decolonizing our healthcare system. Um, so, John, over to you. Thank you so much, Nash. I really appreciate it. Good to see you. I hope everybody had a good weekend. Um, I normally have my small earphones in, but I seem to misplace them. So, I have these moon boom box on my ears here. But uh, so nice to see you. Many of you don't know me. You may have seen me a couple of times in some of these webinars, but I thought I would just speak to kind of right off of what Jacqueline almost said. There seems to be a bit of a theme there. And so I'm just going to share a, a little bit of a PowerPoint to take you through for you to get an understanding, I think, of who we are and where do we fit in the interdisciplinary field of, of health. And um, so if you don't mind, I'm just going to share my screen here this up and uh, let's go from the beginning. I'm trying to find the, the beginning button here. If you go to slideshow at the, there you there go. There we go. Alrighty. So uh, my name is John Hayward, the executive director of the Canadian Association for Spiritual Care. So I'm in based just north of Toronto. Uh, we're an organization that's been around for a long time in the field of chaplaincy, 
um, uh, throughout all segments of society. So we're primarily in the healthcare setting. So you have most likely brushed shoulders with a spiritual care practitioner, somebody along your journey, you've, you've seen this. And so most of ours do work at hospitals. They run the spiritual care departments um, in Nova Scotia, um, you know, very robust teams. And then we have Canada. So we have about, I'll take you through some of the things so you can get an understanding of who we are. So um, just for me, just so you get to introduce to me, I was a former minister for 19 years and um, lived overseas, did work over in the Philippines, over in Hong Kong, a lot of work, came back. Uh, I was in the church for 19 years and made a shift into the not-for-profit. And that's where I went to the Canadian Cancer Society, to the Alzheimer's Society of uh, Canada as the chief development officer for Canada, went to Engineers Without Borders. And then decided to come over to the Canadian Association for Spiritual Care because my real concern about not so much church organized religion structure, um, I'm advocating more for people to have the right and access to spiritual health and to uh, have somebody come in and actually help people journey through those very difficult questions of life. And why am I going through this? Why me, not them? Like, what's going to happen when I die? All of those questions. And it's not so much to guide people into a set form of religion. It's more of dealing with their human spirit and helping their human spirit journey through this trauma or this experience. And we know that uh, we exist, according to what I've heard from World Health Organization and from United Nations and our own government, we body mind and spirit so we're on the spirit side of the house of trying to navigate that and how we work interdisciplinary so i also sit on a couple of boards um, just had a great meeting with maid uh the whole board of maid last week um and how they would like to start implementing spiritual care into the practice or into the process of uh, someone that is seeking maid so we're making strides but i'm just trying to clear up as I talk to people in other disciplines, what the mindset may be is the old school was a pastor from a Baptist church came in and visited his Baptist person in this hospital, right? That's what I did for 19 years. I never had any clinical psycho-spiritual education training like our members do, and who actually work in the profession and work in, in segments like hospitals, Canadian Armed Forces, um, uh, prison, all sorts of sectors they work in. So our purpose here at the association, so you know, is to advance professionalism of spiritual care and psycho-spiritual therapy in Canada. Our values that we have within this organization is a self-awareness and spiritual growth as the core of what we do. That's probably one of the toughest journeys someone being trained in CASC would have to go through is that self-reflection and interpersonal work to actually get to a place of where they can, in their own mind and, and spirit, provide good care. Um, educating and practicing according to the highest standards of spiritual care and psycho-spiritual therapy, collaboration with aligned organizations. So this is why with Naj and, and me, there just seems to be a very solid connection there because of the lens that Naj looks through and what I look through and find those common grounds that are going to really enhance our work to the client, uh, the wholeness of care. So the more that we can collaborate and work with other disciplines and respect where we all fit within the healthcare system. Um, our role really is to provide the best care possible to those that are going through their journey. And so it's so important for us to align ourselves with other organizations. Empathy and treating people with compassion and dignity and inclusivity is our values. Now, who are we? We're 1,200 members across the country. We're actually around 1,250 now. We have national, we have nine regions. So we have an Atlantic region in Nova Scotia. And um, I know Nova Scotia Health is going through some transitions, even with spiritual care, and we're just advocating very hard. And this is where partnership comes into play because Naj is my best partner in Nova Scotia. And um, that actually has given me a lot of insight and coached me along, but I think it's a, it's a reciprocal type relationship. So we're, Spiritual care is a growing profession. Uh, this is odd to see this type of growth come in to this profession um, when others may be suffering. I, I, My gut tells me that a lot has to do with 
where the world's at today and the turmoil and the angst and um, the insecurities that it's really opened up a whole conversation in regards to spiritual care. And this is not religious, like I said, but there's a, something distressful that people are trying to navigate and they can't really put their finger on it. Um, so where do we work? Hospital, long-term care, hospice, prison, Canadian Armed Forces, first responders, EAP and private practice. So we are multi-faith. Um, so last night I was over at the Jaffrey Community Center in Toronto, where I celebrated the end of Ramadan. And because we're starting a new clinical psychospiritual um, unit in the community center, they've decided to partner with us after I met with their board. And um, so I come in and I sit with the Imams when we're eating and I'm like a guest, but it's, we have this very tight relationship now. And it's, um, it's, so we have multi-faith. So Muslim, Jewish, Christian, Buddhist, um, uh, agnostic, believe it or not. There's all sorts of people that find themselves into our organization where they have a deep spirituality and they go through the training to provide that type of care. We have, uh, three commissions uh we have an education standards commission professional practice commission ethics commission and uh we have accountabilities with peer-to-peer -peer ethical standards regulatory bodies that are stepping in and coming into where we fall under a regulatory body now and that's this is basically the certification this is what they've achieved they've completed four units of supervised psychospiritual education They've had competency assessments, a thousand clinical hours, two year graduate master's degree in theology or another field is a prerequisite to come into the into the units and professional papers demonstrating their competency. So um, it's a very serious and long journey for somebody to come to certification. And then they are qualified to sit as part of the interdisciplinary team at uh, providing health. And I, I would like to say how much I appreciate these types of meetings where we can have the dialogue with one another to see what it is that we could do better. Like I, I would really like our practitioners to have a clear understanding of the role of social work, you know, just so we learn more about one another and what our role and our function is for the end goal to provide the best care possible to those we serve in a very diverse uh, country. So um, I just wanted to give a snapshot of that and um, just celebrate that. Thank you so very much. Um, thank you for for your kind comments as well. And um, it's worth noting that the advocacy that um, John is referencing when he talks about me is not me, it's the interprofessional collaborative mm -hmm. care group that we have started. And just a heads up that we will be having our next event May 2nd. And um, it's a four part educational series and a four part. second we're going to be talking about heart attacks because people who have heart attacks it is um it is typical that people who have heart attacks might sometimes have anxiety or depression and yet it is not standard practice for people who have a heart attack to be given counseling and support um we got to hear a little bit from uh Jacqueline about the role of uh spiritual care in death and dying and how uh, without that kind of training, then we don't have that ability to um, get the care that we need from a mental health prevention perspective. So again, decolonizing healthcare involves bringing all of the disciplines together to remove that fake either or and recognizing that there are unique needs, especially um, and Mobina is not here right now, um, so we can send her some love, light, and healing energy. 
that she was going to be talking about within the Muslim community and the new newcomers to Canada community, how many um, people depend upon a chaplain to provide that level of uh, specialized religious community services to be that connection to the mosque or the imam to be that connection. Um, and then Terry, who also is not able to be here, the good news is we'll be able to have a much better dialogue, but was going to speak about within um, the uh, African Nova Scotian community and within BIPOC communities more broadly, the role of um, religion and spirituality as being central to mental health. Um, and hopefully Yusuf will join us in a few moments and is going to be able to speak a little bit about how um, interfaith communities can partner with the Canadian Mental Health Association on this. But religion and spirituality is uh, not always safe. It can cause harm as we're going to hear in a few moments from Jordan. And that's actually why it's important for people who have specific training in spiritual care to be the ones talking about spirituality because sometimes people may um, like the, the Baptist minister that um, John referenced that many, I'm sure John did a beautiful job and many Baptist ministers do beautiful jobs, but some might unintentionally say things like, oh, God doesn't give you more than you can handle or things like that, that um, sometimes cause tremendous harm um, psychologically to people. So when we're thinking about advocating for mental health, we're advocating for uh, mental health that is diverse and inclusive and is spiritually informed and decolonizing in its intersectionalities. So um, because we're committed to safety um, as a primary part of our advocacy, uh, grateful to have Jordan here and I'll let Jordan introduce himself um, thank you so much for being here and sharing a little bit about you and your work. Thank you, Nash. Thanks for inviting me, and I'm I'm honored to be with you all today. Um, I have enjoyed a, um, a deeply enriching, challenging, and humbling uh, experience in working with Nash on and off for the last few years. Um, I've also worked 10 years with the Canadian Mental Health Association from the late 80s to the late 90s. So it uh, feels good to be sort of coming home today a little bit. Um, so I'm a, I'm a trans man um, and I am a survivor of religious-based conversion therapy practices and change efforts. So I wanna begin just by defining some terms. <clears throat> Conversion practices include a wide range of formal and structured practices, treatments, or services that attempt to change a person's sexual orientation to heterosexual, uh, gender identity to cisgender, or gender expression to match their assigned sex at birth. Um, I will refer to these efforts as conversion practices, recognizing that they are not considered a reputable form of therapy. SOGIS, um, which stands for Sex Orientation and Gender Identity or Expression Change Efforts, include any kind of subtle or blatant pressures or messages to change, deny, suppress, or lead a person to doubt their sexual or gender identity or expression. They can be just as harmful as conversion practices. The Community-Based Research Center, or CBRC, has asked about these experiences through our Sex Now survey and our health, our health survey, uh, through research, education, and knowledge mobilization initiatives, including our 2020 policy brief, we have meaningfully engaged with survivors and key stakeholders towards collective and intersectoral action. Earlier this year, CBRC launched the website stopconversionpractices.ca, which I would encourage you to check out. Um, it is a knowledge center on conversion practices and the federal law. We are just beginning an intersectoral action fund project to establish a national coalition to end conversion practices in Canada. By promoting a harmful or traumatic self-image, Conversion practices and change efforts impact a person's sense of self at, at, at our very core. Um, they can cause serious harm by reinforcing inner shame 
and self-hatred of one's sexuality or gender identity, often manifested as internalized homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia. Long-term health impacts include shame, <clears throat> depression, anxiety, social phobias, substance use challenges, homelessness, suicidality, complex trauma or PTSD, developmental trauma, religious trauma, sexual and relationship problems, low self-esteem or self-worth, fear of rejection or abandonment, and much more. One of the most dangerous settings where conversion practices happen is the healthcare system. Adverse health system experiences of all kinds can amplify the impact of systemic trauma and increase the likelihood of seeking often life-sustaining care. Conversion practices in healthcare-based contexts include service providers who believe that being to us LGBTQA plus is a pathology to be fixed. Conversion practices within religious contexts are particularly dangerous. They happen through faith leaders and teachers who teach that being queer, trans, or two-spirit <clears throat> is irreconcilable with your faith or religious beliefs. And they are based on the assumption that these core identities are caused by spiritual problems, trauma, or abuse, and so can be fixed or healed. Religious-based trauma is profound. Um, Naj has helped me to understand, I think, even more um, of what that impact is, I think, in many ways, because I have also um, faced that, dealt with that for decades of my life. I um, I haven't paid a lot of attention to it, and I think it's my own fear um, of facing some of my religious-based trauma. It is so profound, comprehensive, and all-encompassing, and it can spill over into the actions of healthcare providers. Religious trauma amplifies complex trauma because it impacts so many different areas of someone's functioning, faith, meaning, purpose, community, relationships, sexuality, identity, coping mechanisms, and so much more. The negative health impacts of conversion practices and change efforts are amplified for survivors who experience multiple and overlapping forms of oppression. The negative health impacts <clears throat> um, were the Sex Now survey, excuse me, the CBRC Sex Now survey in 2019 found that experiences of conversion practices were higher among non-binary and trans respondents. Um, youth ages 15 to 19, immigrants, and racial and ethnic minorities. Previous scholarship has emphasized the need to further explore the intersection of ethno-racial identity and immigration status with conversion practices, particularly given the overrepresentation of Indigenous Black and people of color, communities, and immigrants in recent conversion practices estimates. However, these experiences have not been fully explored through qualitative research in Canada. To address this gap, CBRC conducted a qualitative study in 2023 to understand the experiences of 2SLGBTQ plus survivors who are Black, Indigenous, people of color, newcomer, immigrants, and refugees. The study found that these survivors experienced conversion practices in faith-based medical and medical contexts both within and outside of Canada. Study participants described facing barriers due to intersecting oppressions based on their race, ethnicity, immigration status, language, religion, and other diverse identities and experiences. For example, intersecting oppressions such as racism, xenophobia, classism, and, and or Islamophobia, put survivors into an even more isolating position, making them more vulnerable to conversion practices. Participants identified various forms of conversion practices and sojis across different settings, such as medical, religious, educational, and familial contexts, with participants frequently experiencing them in multiple settings. And that is common for all survivors. All survivors need culturally sensitive, 
trauma-informed support that fully attends to our intersecting sexual, gender, ethno-racial, religious, and other diverse identities and experiences. In our 2022 Survivor Support Project, we found that only 12% of survivors were able to find a therapist who could provide this kind of support. I've been working with Naj and other mental health practitioners across Canada with the, with the goal of creating a referral network for survivors, connecting them with therapists who have the experience and expertise in working with survivors of conversion practices. That's a challenge. There is no current training for that. Um, um, yeah, that's, that's something I've been working on now for three years, and we hope to continue to, to address it um, and hopefully get something created maybe later this year. It takes courage and the assurance of safety for a survivor to reach out for help or to share their story. When a survivor reaches out to someone, they may be unsure of the validity of their own experience hesitant to identify as a survivor, maybe comparing their experiences with others who they think had things much worse. They may be struggling with shame, filled with rage, overcome with grief, paralyzed by fear or suicidal. They may also have an understandably strong distrust of religious leaders in communities, healthcare practitioners, including mental health professionals, social workers, and child protection workers, because that's where they were harmed or traumatized. Ongoing barriers to the eradication of conversion practices that we need to address with legislatures and policymakers include a lack of policy responses targeting trans conversion practices, a lack of effective reporting and or enforcement mechanisms for the federal law, the need for action on the part of provincial governments who are responsible for health care, and the need for action among healthcare regulatory bodies. The alarming rise in anti-trans and queer hate in Canada, including recent legislative efforts to roll back protections for trans and gender expansive youth, make it even more likely that they will be subjected to some form of conversion practices. So we need your voices, your advocacy and activism to speak up for queer, trans and two-spirit people and work together to end these harmful practices in Canada. Thank you. Thank you so very much for sharing more about that. And this is exactly why um, it's important to have training and that we look at safety more broadly. And um, I am putting in the chat right here um, some information about uh, what Yusuf was going to share, but I think that Yusuf is having difficulties connecting. So um, I'm going to share uh, just a screen of um, what he was going to talk about. Uh, he works with Foundation for a Path Forward in British Columbia out west, and it's an interfaith organization that works collaboratively to break down silos of intersectional oppression and is looking at um, expanding in Atlantic Canada. So contact me if you're interested. But one of the many projects that he's working on is around fighting around stigma around mental health and wellness in different faith communities. There are lots of reasons why uh, people might not feel safe getting mental health services. And we heard from Jacqueline why, um, and we heard from, um, we heard from Jordan why that is true in other types of communities. And then we learned about the importance of really looking at training for spiritual care providers um, and healthcare providers that are informed. So one of the education programs that they have is specifically looking at um, the, a partnership with the Canadian Mental Health Association um, that is uh, helping to build pathways of and access and building more um, understanding. And here you can see Mobina, who is going to be on this panel as well, but is not well feeling well, um, and who is uh, one of the many practitioners that is working to transform the way we access healthcare and communicate about it in religious communities because of the tremendous stigma. We're going to now have a chance to hear from one of our own members, um, 
and her name is Krista, and she um, is going to share a little bit more about herself in a second. Um, and she's going to help us think about new ways of re-envisioning how people can access mental health care here in beautiful, unseated Mi'kma'ki. Hello, and thank you for inviting me to be part of your advocacy day and to speak about some of the work that we've been doing. My name is Krista Matheson. I'm a program manager with the Canadian Mental Health Association, Nova Scotia Division. We are piloting a project called Empower, where the mission is to help build community capacity to support mental health. Since the pandemic, it's been no secret that people are experiencing mental health concerns more than we've typically seen in the past. Our hope is that by providing some support and new tools, that communities can find some resolution by tapping into their greatest resource, the people. The first step of our journey was to speak with the people to gain a better understanding of their experiences of navigating the formal and informal mental health systems. We held in-person engagements and gathered surveys with community members and professionals alike to learn about the types of support that people were seeking out, the barriers standing in their way, and to really consider what was important to them. Given the limited capacity within our team, we narrowed our scope to the Sydney and Yarmouth regions to begin with full intentions of expanding to more areas in the province, depending on the success of the pilot. When we arrived, people were eager to talk about mental health and the needs of their communities. They identified a need for improved mental health care in both formal and informal systems. Originally, this project was intended to support very informal front-facing roles in community. For example, a barber, a school bus driver, a reverend, even a bartender, to provide appropriate tools to support them with some of the needs coming through their doors. However, the more that we listened to people, we learned that there was a bit of a gap. Community members expressed that when they went somewhere for support, they were often referred to another agency only to arrive at the next location to learn that they didn't provide that support either. Some people shared stories about seeking out multiple agencies and ending back at square one, having not received the help they were seeking. Many folks urged that better collaboration between service providers is needed. When we spoke with service providers, we heard work that was intended to happen in collaboration was too often siloed. Some frontline supports expressed that clients were arriving misinformed about the su supports available and workers were forced to either turn them away or take on a role that they didn't sign up for. Others reported that they had found it challenging to know where to refer people to when the support required was beyond their capacity. Ultimately, the areas of interest gained from our engagements from both community and professionals fell into four main categories. First, more people were really craving opportunities for connection. Next was a more streamlined system for navigating and accessing the supports that are available. Next was education, but less formal and easily applied to their work or family situation and more opportunities to learn from each other. And lastly, for an increase of community outreach from both formal and informal systems. Based on our qualitative data, what resulted was an interactive workshop developed by our education team to continue this exploration with community and strategize ways to build and strengthen a network of support. We know that a one-size-fits-all program is a thing of the past. As Empower engages with various community groups, we hold ourselves accountable to seek to understand and take direction from those that we aim to serve. We owe it to our communities to remain flexible and to acknowledge and validate who people are, their truths, and what they need. The Empower program was intentionally designed to not just be community-influenced community in the development, but community-led in the rollout. We strive to relieve excluded and underserved groups from the responsibility of doing the adapting and allowing them agency over the wellness of their communities. Empower is working to shift the traditional norms of decisions being made for communities instead of with communities. Some community groups remain cautious about considering our workshop, and understandably so. The last thing anyone wants to see is another new program parachuting in, handing over a to-do list, and then parachuting out again. 
Empower's foundational pillars are based on the mental health continuum, navigating the resources available in each unique community, and shifting the conversation to what's good for me is good for we. A network or a hub is not a new idea, but what often happens is people will come together, they'll look around the table and ask, who's missing? They invite more and they bring them in with a more than merrier mentality. Everyone is building relationship, more people get invited, and eventually it becomes difficult to maintain so many relationships that will impact the work. The meetings continue to happen regularly and they'll talk about all the right things, but the needle isn't moving forward and the, they plateau at this place and they think it's not working or they lose interest because no real change is happening. The difference between a high performing network that Empower strives for is that they are strategic about who's connected with whom, who needs to be at what meeting and why, and allows for a much more defined plan and one that the community has designed of working together toward a common goal. We're careful not to overwhelm with unrealistic expectations. We're certainly not limiting what can be achieved with this. Success can happen on a small scale and still be impactful. And with small wins, if the network is supported properly, Empower has the potential to grow and establish stronger connections and healing. Our team hopes that with proper resources and with your rally of support behind us, that our mission to increase and amplify existing skills, knowledge and involvement of community to support the mental health in a way that communities can have ownership for of is achievable. Thank you for your support. All right, thank you so very much, um, Krista, for sharing a little bit about this vision of how can we redesign. And um, those of you who attended our December conference on safety know that we were talking about the role of engineering to transform um, how services are deployed. And in fact, um, we have uh, one of our members here who can talk a bit about how um, she worked with uh, engineers to redesign how social work um, was redeployed in her organization. And that's an upcoming professional development event that I'm looking forward to asking her to speak at, um, because this is how we redesign um, and reconfigure our vision of wellness. And um, it really means moving beyond that biomedical model to one that is grounded in community, um, informed by the Mi'kmaq land-based teachings and values that we must all begin to align with. And that makes uh, doesn't look at just the physical and then maybe a little bit of the mental health if you can afford to pay extra, but really looks at a much more broad understanding of wellness. And so it is with that that I invite Karn to um, turn on her um, camera, and uh, we are so grateful to have Karn here, uh, Executive Director of the Canadian Mental Health Association that is um, co-sponsoring today with us. Um, so grateful to have you here to help us in our efforts to advocate for universal mental health and for a new and improved integrated vision of what health can look like for everyone. Well, thanks, thanks so much, Naj, and the whole social work community for including us in your day. Um, this is something that we've uh, participated in since I uh, started with CMHA, and I find that the um, the values and the uh, beliefs of the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers and the way they show up in community with respect to advocacy is so well aligned with the work that we do, and, and we only serve to amplify each other. So I'm really, really, really grateful for this time. I do believe that together we can do great things. And today is just one small, sweet example of that. And I appreciate the work that everyone is doing and the spirit in which we are coming today. And I'm always learning more and more and more about um, the world that we live and work in. I remember once reading something that Naj wrote. They, they talked about advocacy as an expression of moral distress with the status quo. And I, I love that because that that is the the energy that uh, inspires us to get into this advocacy space. 
highlighting the healing properties of advoc has, advocacy has when it's done in a way that builds connection between everyone while focusing upon the shared goals of the unique intersectional contributions of every single person, profession, and community organization. In the spirit of today, it's so clear that that is what we are trying to co-create. So as Nash said, my name is Karen Nichols. I'm the executive director of the Canadian Mental Health Association. Uh, we are the Nova Scotia Division. And so for those of you who may be a little bit unfamiliar with us, um, we are part of a federated system and that spans the whole country in 300 communities across every province in the, and the Yukon. And we're a collective of organizations and we're kind of bound by brand and mission. But in every province, we look and feel a little bit different. CMHA Nova Scotia Division and our three branches provide advocacy, programs and resources that help prevent mental health problems and illnesses. We support recovery and resilience and enable Nova Scotians to flourish and thrive. Here in Mi'kma'ki, we deliver safe, inclusive, evidence-based programs, as well as the training and navigation support that Nova Scotians need to both be well and to stay well. These programs include support finding and maintaining affordable housing, assistance finding sustainable, well-paying jobs, and access to mental health literacy tools and education. These programs are free and they're available to everyone living in Nova Scotia. So today I want to take about five minutes of your time to talk a little bit about the advocacy work that we are doing across the province and across the country as part of the CMHA Federation and often alongside the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers. And we want to do that to improve access to mental health care and service, pretty simply put. Throughout this month of the social worker, I've had I felt really, really privileged to have heard a variety of really crucial perspectives on everything from the impact of MAID in our community uh, to the importance of acknowledged healing that incorporates mind, body, and spirit, as we're talking about today. And it's, it's a notion that is, um, it's due. Every conversation is opening my eyes a little wider and my heart a little more broadly to the multiple realities that coexist in our world. And it makes it a kind of a complicated and confusing place on the best of days. But undoubtedly, there will always be contentious issues. We know that. And topics that kind of bump uncomfortably into our individual morals and values. But I just keep thinking, how lucky are we that we live in a community, this community, that can facil facilitate and curate these conversations in a way that is really safe and really inclusive. What a wonderful playground to establish and strengthen our own moral framework without fear of judgment or retribution. That is a gift. I, I just, just have to say that. At the heart of all these conversations sits the broader question, however, of our shared humanity, and more specifically in my world, how do we support individuals living with mental illness or struggling with their wellness in communities that are laden with stigma, structural or otherwise, and judgment? So as we pause for reflection, we contemplate the values that guide us in concert with the inclusive future that we aspire to create for every single human being within our province, irrespective of race, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation or ability. So at CMHA, our mission is to ensure that every individual can access a comprehensive range of mental health and substance youth health programs and supports guaranteed to them under the international human rights law. Universal mental health care, as we envision it, involves the seamless integration of these essential services into our public health care system available to all at no cost. This encompasses not only the traditional treatments, but also the innovative life-saving interventions that are currently inaccessible to so, so many people. Additionally, it means that these services are culturally sensitive, trauma-informed, and grounded in principles of health equity. Many, many, many of the themes that Naj has already touched upon. We believe Canada and our province are failing to meet its human rights obligations when people with a mental illness cannot receive programs, supports, and resources they need to be well and live with dignity. Said another way, our governments have an obligation to ensure that a person has all the resources they need to live. For example, an absence of affordable housing, income supports, and or, and or food security must not be the reason that someone chooses MAID. Investing in mental health and substance use health isn't merely a matter of moral obligation. It's also a strategic imperative, and it's the intelligent choice. It's just not a matter of fairness. It's recognition of the interconnectedness of our well-being and the strength of our society as whole. Somewhere along the line, we, we forget that piece of the puzzle, and it's extremely important to remember. By prioritizing mental health and substance use health, 
We invest in healthier individuals, stronger communities, and a more resilient province and nation. Full stop. At CMHA Nova Scotia, we believe and advocate for a universal system that is real and fair and grounded in supporting wellness. A universal system that would give all people in Canada access to publicly funded mental health and substance youth health services, no matter who they are or where they live. These services must be equally available to all, be portable when moving between provinces and territories, and they must be provided free and without discrimination. Advocating for a real system means we want to ensure that the front door to support is both obvious and accessible, and it leads to a clear path of health and well being. When we did our strategic planning about three years ago, we went out to the community and we talked to uh, probably about 500 folks from all across the province. And the common theme was, I don't even know where the front door is to get help. And so we really need to work at making that a clear and more obvious path. It also means a shift away from the patchwork of hard to find waitlisted mental health and substance youth health services. It means more community-based organizations like ours, CMHA, are no longer funded by short-term grants or donations alone, trying to make it work on project by project while not understanding or being able to address the full system issues. It means counseling and psychotherapy services will be accessible to all and not only to those who can pay for them. It means creating a real system of integrated, accessible, publicly funded care backed by long-term sustainable core funding for community-based services. And don't get me going on core funding. We believe and advocate for a fair system. We all play a role in righting the structural in inequities that lie at the heart of the poor mental health and substance youth health concerns. We've heard uh, some of this today. This requires countering the harms that are caused by colonialism, racism, sexism, and ableism that permeate our healthcare systems and lead to poor health outcomes. It means taking on an anti-racist and anti-oppressive approach to policy making and service delivery, as well as taking into account the social determinants of health and recognizing the importance of upstream preventative care. In practical terms, Disaggregated data must be collected so we know who receives the care and who doesn't. And we need to begin to understand why not. We need to bring more transparency to the development of health policies and budgets. While we close the gaps in access uh, and address systemic discrimination, diverse people with lived and living experience of mental illness and substance use health concerns need to be included in a meaningful way in our healthcare and justice system reforms, especially in discussions like the ones we're having today. Finally, we believe and advocate for a wellness system. We need to strive to make people well so that they can live full and healthy lives, recover, thrive, and accomplish their goals and dreams while giving back to the community and the society as a whole. This includes recognizing the importance of mental health promotion, mental health prevention, education, recovery-oriented approach, and the elimination of stigma. Mental wellness requires balance between the mental, the physical, the spiritual, and the emotional parts of ourselves. It also includes providing coordinated services that are culturally safe. So back in the fall of 2022, I had the privilege and the opportunity to travel to Ottawa to share the message that is tied to CMHA's Act for Mental Health. Um, Naj has been a really great supporter of this, and I think that uh, this opportunity really brings to the forefront the purpose of this Act for Mental Health. Broadly speaking, um, the Act is an advocacy campaign that rallies Canadians to press our leaders nationally and provincially for universal mental health care. We want to make mental health and substance use health care available to everyone under the public health insurance. So as you know, mental health and substance use problems are rampant in Nova Scotia and across the country, but millions of people aren't getting the help they need. We all know and live that reality in our current system, and I'm certain that everyone on this call feels it every single day. Our healthcare system is not universal at all, especially where mental health is concerned. We need care before crisis. We need a safety net that's not riddled with holes and wait lists. We need compassion, not criminalization for substance use issues. We need an easy to find and easy to open front door for mental health care system that is free and timely. Act for Mental Health is a campaign. It's a rallying cry. It's a movement for mental health care that is truly universal. The evidence is clear that funding mental health care is really the smart thing to do. The demands that are under the umbrella of the Act for Mental Health are counseling and psychotherapy services to be covered by public health insurance, 
adequate funding for, and universally available for community programs like ourselves and services, mental illness prevention, mental health promotion services, suicide prevention, and mental health literacy, all the work that CMHA and so many other organizations do across this country, integrated publicly funded substance use prevention and treatment services and harm reduction services, housing, income supports, and food security, and the end to criminalization of drug use in favor of providing the care people need without barriers and without stigma. For all of us, Act for Mental Health is a chance to stand up, be counted, use our voices to press our provincial leaders for universal mental health care. Through our collective advocacy for the psychosocial, spiritual, and structural determinants of care and for the structural policies and practices that can improve mental health services and outcomes, as well as the policies and funding to support this work, only then can we begin to truly understand that and benefit from the true universal mental health care. This is the work that will enable us all to thrive. This is the work that will help us build stronger communities, one individual at a time. Naj, I'm so, so grateful for this opportunity to spend time with you today. I really believe that our collaborative partnership is a good example of the kind of advocacy support and partnerships that social workers can provide to those with lived and first voice experiences as well. I was in a workshop recently and collaborating and dreaming a bit with some social impact organizations from across the province, which is another partnership. And someone mentioned the African proverb that, proverb that says, sticks in a bundle are unbreakable. And I believe this is especially true when it comes to CMHA Nova Scotia and Nova Scotia College of Social Workers when we advocate together. Social workers serve as an invaluable connector within the social fabric of our communities. The, you act as advocates for those who feel marginalized or unheard. You bring together individuals who may otherwise feel isolated. You provide platforms to voice concerns such as today and experiences and you empower individuals to navigate complex systems, access essential services and assert your rights. My humble opinion, your commitment to social justice and equity makes you indispensable agents of positive change within our communities. This is so important. I believe that coming together at events like today, talking about advocacy serving, it serves to strengthen our communities because the best vision for a shared future is one where everyone's voice and perspective is heard and valued. I just want to take one second and thank every one of you for all you do and then the privilege of your time today. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm very touched by your comments, um, but mostly deeply inspired by them. I, I messaged you, I was like, we have to publish this. Um, but truly this vision of a partnership between the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers and the Canadian Mental Health Association reflects our vision of what advocacy can look like. Together we are stronger. And that quote that you reflected is part of the vision of Advocacy Day. We are 3,000 social workers across unceded Mi'kma'ki, Nova Scotia. And if each of us have five people that we could contact, that suddenly those 3,000 becomes 15,000 people. And then if we partner with the Canadian Mental Health Association, we can flood our MLAs and our elected representatives with this vision of universal mental health care accessible to all. That personally is my peace plan for the world. Mm -hmm. If we all could have some mental health counseling that was free and some of the money that goes towards guns and violence and bombs went instead towards universal mental health care. Like that would solve so <laughs> many problems. Let's give it a try. Let's just take two years, give it a try and then see if it's worth the investment. Exactly. Uh, that we can save money. But <laughs> this vision of both of us coming together, that social workers we sometimes do burn out because we're it's all uh, us all alone. We feel like it's us all alone. And then by lifting up first voices who often feel all alone, it, we're not alone anymore. And mm -hmm. then when we add in um, the, the spiritual care providers, and then we bring in all of the different healthcare providers, then we are even bigger. But I am excited to say that we have Yusuf, who is here. Um, I showed you, uh, I showed you Yusuf's website, <laughs> One Path Forward. But even better than me trying to talk about what he's doing, Yusuf. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so, salam alaikum. So grateful to have you here. Thank you, salam. 
uh, peace be with you and peace be with everyone else today. Uh, it really is an honor to be uh, on the panel. Um, I'm actually in Vancouver. Uh, that's why I was a little bit well, late. It started at 6 a.m. and the scheduling I was missed, messed up on. <laughs> but it's important and I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm talking to you folks from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Uh, part of the work that we do at Foundation for a Path Forward is to leverage and learn the um, ways and means of traditional approaches to mental health support, both from First Nations in Canada, but also Indigenous peoples around the world. Um, the challenges that we're facing in today's time might be expressed in novel ways, such as with social media, such as with isolation, but the solutions to challenges are based on human beings and our human experiences. And those have been around for tens of thousands of years. So there's some really cool work being done here on land-based trauma therapy, um, how to reconnect with our ancestral um, values and how to connect community with both not only the land that we're on, which has intrinsic value, um, but also with the um, the kind of spiritual concepts that are associated with that. And it's been very fascinating to be learning about the different approaches around the world to that type of work. But I digress. Let's start at the beginning. So Foundation for a Path Forward is actually a pretty interesting organization. Um, we co-founded this, my colleague Tarek Tayab and I, in Vancouver uh, back in 2020. Um, previous to that, we were doing a lot of work on addressing Islamophobia after the Quebec City mosque shootings. There was a lot of trauma, a lot of pain um, in both the Canadian Muslim community, but also the Canadian community at large. Um, six people were killed by a person who was motivated by um, white supremacist ideology and radicalized online. And at each and every one of these steps, had there been a little bit of mental health intervention, it's very possible that this tragedy wouldn't have happened. So from our end, we started to think, how can we address not only this challenge, but other challenges facing multiple communities, because through the interfaith dialogue and exchange that we've done for years, we came to realize a very interesting fact that the the um, the the problems and challenges facing our community were mirrored in other communities. It wasn't unique to us. The expression of Islamophobia might be a flavor of the trauma, but same with anti-Semitism, anti-Indigenous hate, anti-Black hate, and, you know, even anti-white hate, anti-Christian hate. In our work, we've started to see a lot of this. Over 30 churches were burnt down in Canada over the last few years. Many people don't know that. There's historical, you know, um, circumstances around why people were motivated to, to do that. But in and of itself, it's horrible, right? So we had to come up with a way to um, address this from a broad perspective. And we felt that was, for us, the best approach. Um, so our theory of change is to break down barriers between communities and work together on shared concerns. Um, and from that approach and the work that we've done with communities, we were actually nominated by the province of British Columbia to be the first official faith community convener for anti-racism initiatives. And that um, opened up a lot of doors for us. So I'm sure you can imagine that you know, uh, when you get official backing, uh, there's people who trust you more and then there's people who trust you less. <laughs> But then for what we were able to do, because we've worked so deeply with many communities, um, we had a really strong board with indigenous representation, black representation, um, you know, gender minority representation, Asian representation. We were able to kind of really lean back on our actual community work um, from a grassroots level and say, you know, we're not sellouts, guys. This is we have to collaborate government is a community. It's You know, even though they take our taxes, they are still a community of people, and they have a lot of good people in there who are working very hard to support and advocate for this concept that we were trying to focus on. So we do many things, but for today's call, I really want to focus on something that is so fundamental to what we've seen as a big challenge, which is the stigmatization of mental health support and mental health issues within faith communities. And there's many reasons for that, right? There's um, there's a concept that you're not praying hard enough, right? And this is across religions, right? And there's a concept that if there's something wrong with your mental health, then the best thing to do is to seek spiritual advice. And if you don't, then you're a bad person. I am happy to say, guys, that in our work, we have seen that mindset being reduced tremendously. 
Now we've been invited to mosques. We've been invited to synagogues, to churches, to talk about these issues. And there is such, such passionate, you know, appreciation for it. And when we start to think, what, what changed? You know, it's like, oh, it was all our work. We made such a big difference. We've changed minds. No, <laughs> right. The reality is that the trauma and the pain has just gotten to such a level, whether it's with drug addiction, whether it's with, you know, social isolation, whether it's with online hate and harms um, because of, you know, kids getting cell phones at three years old and being exposed to the wonderful world that is the Internet, you know, and the incredible amount of trauma that happened because of the social isolation and COVID-19. So the um, the fire, as it were, has gotten so hot that no one can ignore it anymore. No one can have kind of their own pet theories about things. It's there. It's real. We have to address it. So it, it kind of was like at the right time for us to start intervention and engagement with communities um, and with um, institutions. So we work closely with the Canadian Mental Health Association, Canadian Mental Health Commission at a national level, at a provincial level. We work with all kinds of organizations from both faith communities and from mental health supporters to really be connecting people and saying, hey, you know, the, the key thing to understand is, number one, you are not alone. And number two, what's happening to you is not the first time this happened. And there are solutions. And for people to feel that, to feel like, hey, you know, this is not a special punishment on me, but this is something as a human being that I'm experiencing, we're able to kind of help them along that path. One of the most successful things that we have been able to offer, and we're really excited about this one, um, over the last, uh, I would say, six months in particular, has been um, free anger management training. How to actually mitigate the anger that people are feeling at either global events or local expressions of those events or what's going on. It's mind-blowing. So we partnered with an organization called Moose Anger Management. And I think to date we've provided um, about $20,000 in uh, free free care. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, um, um, uh, the Karn was saying was like, you know, how do we get these things funded for people who can't afford it? Because the government's not currently providing it. But the change in people's lives is tremendous. When you go through the six week program, people are blown away by how much they didn't know about themselves, how much they didn't know about these processes, how integrated this can be into their own faith traditions. It's not like trying to convert people to, you know, I, I had a great experience when I was in Los Angeles. I was invited to the Scientology Center and I got to learn a lot about, you know, their way of doing things. And I was like, OK, great. But, you know, one of the things that people think when providing solutions from a faith perspective is that we're trying to convert them. Um, and then I love playing this game. I was like, I won't tell you what my religion is. Let me just talk to you about what we offer at our organization and see if you can guess. I have had everything, guys. I have had Jewish, I have had Christian, I have had Buddhist, I have had Muslim, and, but it's the funniest thing ever when someone comes up to you and says like, oh, are you indigenous? And I was like, huh? <laughs> like, uh, I'm sure somewhere along the lines. But what that tells me is the solutions to the challenges we're facing, they can come from anywhere. They can be adapted by anyone. And for us to engage with different communities, to build these stronger bear, um, connections, in addressing this issue of the stigmatization and the, the key solutions has been wonderful. Um, we launched a project called Project Fala, which is uh, facilitating advancement in mental health and life support. Um, it's been really good, but one of the key things that we realized again and again was the gap in, 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 his, in people knowing the solutions exist and then being able to be provided with them. And why I say with them is because, as Nacho was saying too, the current approach to healthcare lacks enough investment in mental health. It tends to be an invisible problem. People don't see it because it's technically in our head. They only see the expressions of it. Why are you late for work all the time? Why aren't you hanging out with us at dinner? Why, why are you always crying? Why are you always laughing, right? Sometimes it's expressed in different ways. But I'm pretty sure there were studies done showing the billions of dollars lost. And, and this, I hate when we have to do this for grants and things like that, but it's, it's real. How do we express human tragedy as a number, right? How do we express human suffering as a number? The reason why we do that is to try and change the mindset of the government. How much you guys can save in productivity, 
save in investments, if you were to just invest a little bit in kind of upstream support for community organizations dealing directly with their communities, that you have cultural support, you have cultural specific support, different communities express themselves and respond to different um, versions of the same solution. So it's for us how to educate everyone in the spectrum from the top all the way down and from the down all the way top. So because we create these kind of um, opportunities for folks, we're able to have the conversations that lead towards us. Very happy to see that in British Columbia, they have been um, starting down this path. Um, uh, the Minister uh, for Mental Health and Addictions, um, uh, Jennifer Whiteside, has been a big proponent of this. Um, we're excited to see that our own communities and faith communities have started to take it seriously to address the issues of stigma and addiction. Ten years ago, I could never imagine being in a mosque and talking to them about like psilocybin therapy for PTSD and trauma. I would have, you know, unbelievable. But today we're seeing people accepting this because their own kids are going through addiction. They're going through addiction. Like the problem has become so dramatic that the solutions are very acceptable to people. Um, and I just wanted to really come on today and, and share some of that from, a, I would say, an optimistic perspective that we are seeing this, but it doesn't. It, change doesn't just happen. All of you guys working hard on this, you know, everyone across the country working together. And this is why I was so grateful for Naj to invite me because now we can connect with each other. We can work together on, you know, how do we bring about these solutions at a national level in a systematic and sustainable way? And that's a question that I have for all of you too, right? I would love to learn from you guys what's being done, how we can leverage um, your learnings, how we can leverage your kind of abilities and that we can go forward together. Um, but I know I only had a few minutes. I apologize if I went over. I was just very excited to talk about this today. So um, if if that's good, then I'm good. If you have any questions or I, I don't know what you want to do, Natch, I, I'm, I'm here for you guys. Thank you so very much. Um, as, as, this is my brother from another mother, and I am so deeply grateful to you for your work um, and the work that you're doing. Some of you may not know, but... Um, I, in a previous part of my life, I lived south of the colonial border in the United States, and I was vice president of the largest nonprofit psychiatric hospital freestanding in the United States, amongst the different things I did. And I worked with um, the FBI on a countering violent extremism project. And uh, it stopped uh, in 2016 when new leadership happened. Um, however, that program had a vision of how to help people not be radicalized by online hate, by connecting people to community resources, psychosocial, structural, spiritual components of health, faith communities, um, counseling, addressing those issues. And so as you are talking about how your organization was really formed in response to um, the violence that happened in 2020 in the mosques and the shooting and Islamophobia and white supremacy. I'm so grateful that you're here because Mi'kma'ki, Nova Scotia, is the site of the largest mass casualty event in the United States. It is related to gender-based violence. We have a letter that'll be our closing letter for the day that'll be focused on that. But just so grateful to you for sharing a little bit of um, the work that you're doing that hopefully we can amplify and grow across the rest of um, across the rest of uh, Canada, because thinking about the ways in which we can all work together collaboratively in advocacy in programming. This is part of our partnership with the Canadian Mental Health Association. This is part of the collaborative care series where psychologists and social workers and chaplains, occupational therapists, recreation therapists, we're all coming together to say, we have this vision of health and healing that is better. And then how do we align and partner with communities in safe ways to advocate? That is the vision for today. Um, grateful for our awesome conversations that are happening um, through the um, through the chat. Um, I'm going to just take a moment. We did get to hear from Krista about some beautiful work um, embedding in community and trying to build more sustainable collective approaches to wellness through the Canadian Mental Health Association and grateful to her for her work and representing the social work profession so beautifully. Um, grateful to all of our speakers today for all that they've done. 
this is a, just a little bit on our schedule for the day as we are getting closer to the end. We will be having another um, giveaway of books before um, our lunch break. Um, and our chat is available for continued dialogue um, as we move forward. Um, I am going to be sharing just a little bit about our toolkit that you're going to hear more about, but just to help prepare you for what's happening after lunch. Um, we are going to be talking about our toolkit. Again, a reminder, if you can inspire people you know to use today to send letters to your MLAs, um, and I am planning on sending uh, my MLA, who happens to be Brian Comer, um, who happens to be the Minister of Mental Health. So it just happens to be that I chose to live somewhere where um, he gets to represent me. So I'm going to be sharing some of my letters and some of this with him today as, because he's my MLA. Um, and I invite you to contact your MLA wherever you are and advocate for universal mental health for anything that you're hearing that sparks a specific um, vision of change. Um, that's part of the goal of today is that we are joining together to become a chorus for mental health advocacy. And in the afternoon, we will be hearing from first voice speakers as well as some social workers, but um, some first voice speakers, special thanks to the Canadian Mental Health Association for um, helping us connect with, um, with them and uh, hearing from them what they believe needs to happen to help fix and heal our mental health care system. Um, this is, if you have not yet looked at it, we have it's new and improved from last year when we trialed it with uh, great visuals explaining the different levels of government, how bills become laws. Um, and then we are working on toolkit guidelines for how social workers might work with people who are um, coming with uh, mental health needs. Because for example, if you're depressed because of the housing crisis, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy might help you sleep for the night, but it's not going to fix the housing crisis, which is the real reason why you might be upset and you have good reason to be upset. Therefore, joining together with other people in advocacy, writing um, a letter, this is part of how we address the structural determinants of health, joining together with one another, that's part of mental health healing. And um, that's one of the reasons why the Social Work Code of Ethics requires advocacy because we understand that we are not just individuals but we are part of community and therefore healing requires a whole community this multi-system approach and this is part of our understanding of how to ensure safer social work practice for all and so we have this guideline that i'm showing you right now that we've been working on thanks to our social justice committee for their efforts to um, do that that's um and then our jointly created with the Legal Information Society of Nova Scotia, um, our toolkit that also talks about how to complain up the chain. Um, we're going to talk more about things like how to use a FOI pop to um, help advocate um, your advocacy efforts. Uh, so we're going to continue to provide uh, training and skills on how to do that. Um, I'm going to take this moment to read a letter that was written by several of our um, members. Um, and this is um, the, a shared written letter and perhaps it'll inspire you to write not just your own, but perhaps with a few other people and um, then send that. You can send it to me, you can send it to your MLA. Um, our goal is to reclaim the, the, the advocacy de democratic process and to ensure that our MLAs feel connected to us, that we feel connected to them because part of what ensures a healthy society is people feeling like they can trust their elected representative, regardless of their political party, they are there to support us. And so we um, have to let them know and communicate with them. That's part of the, how democracy works. Um, and that's why the Legal Information Society of Nova Scotia partnered with us on creating this um, toolkit. So I'm gonna read this letter um, that was written and the goal of reading letters today is to inspire us to work collaboratively. And this was um, co-written by social workers who are indigenous, including Mi'kmaq, other First Nations, Métis and Inuit social workers, as well as those of settler descent as an expression of our shared concern 
for the lack of trauma-informed healthcare services in our province and the need to decolonize the systems within which we function. Our code of ethics mandates our commitment to truth and reconciliation. We are writing to ask for your help in ensuring that we are able to meet this ethical obligation. We are called to care for the most vulnerable and marginalized, and it is in this spirit that we are reaching out to you to request an opportunity to talk about how we can work together collaboratively to achieve this outcome. We affirm that the distinction between physical health and the psychosocial, spiritual, and structural determinants of health is colonial and antithetical to the land-based Mi'kmaq teachings that we believe must ground the work that we do. And I was so inspired as Yusuf was talking about land-based trauma therapy. I think that's a lunch and learn we're going to want to learn from. So we are writing to try to improve our mental health system as well as to more effectively integrate it into primary care. We also would like to address the urgent public health necessity for more trauma-informed policies and practices beyond the specific healthcare realm. We are writing this letter as an expression of the deep distress that social workers feel, as also articulated in our report, which noted that almost every social worker employed in our current mental health system experiences severe moral distress due to the current biomedical model of care that does not adequately integrate the psychosocial, spiritual, and structural determinants of care. Our recent research and report highlight recommendations that can ensure safer social work practice and improve public health outcomes. Additional reports have further emphasized these same concerns, such as the one from the Mass Casualty Commission, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and others. In addition, we believe to the structural issues of housing, insecurity, poverty, racism, and intersectional bias, we believe that it is necessary to shift from a pathologizing approach to mental health to a holistic and integrated one that prioritizes tending to grief and trauma, including intergenerational trauma, as an approach to public health and wellness. We still don't have grief support that is accessible to everyone. We are deeply concerned that mental health services are not yet universally accessible, especially when it comes to grief and trauma. The failure to properly address these can lead to profound public health implications. We also wish to articulate our concern for the lack of trauma-informed processes in public spaces more broadly. For example, every day at noon, and those of you who are in Kijipuktuk right now, you will hear it in about eight minutes, Every day at noon, a cannon goes off in our capital. The sound reverberates throughout downtown. While it might be novel and allegedly enticing for some tourists, it is connected to deep trauma for those who live in this region of unseated Mi'kma'ki. There are many reasons why we may oppose this ritual, the experience of gun violence or war, neurodivergent, or we might be especially sensitive to loud sounds, shift workers trying to sleep, those who are unwell and need to rest, who are traumatized by the colonial past of this country and other countries from whence we came, and are cruelly reminded every day that colonial violence is far from over, or who just might find the loud sound to be jarring and unpleasant. This opposition is for our own mental health and that of our neighbors and loved ones, because of the distress it brings for pets and wildlife. While our reasons are varied, there's growing consensus that this daily sounding of the cannon is causing harm. This preventable trauma occurs so regularly that many set their watches to it. This cannon is a symbol for all that is wrong in how we understand trauma and it affects us far beyond the moment of its blasting. This canon is rewiring us. Research shows how trauma affects our brain chemistry and hormones, our heart rate and blood pressure, our ability to concentrate and remember our brains, hearts, spirits, and so much more. Many suffer not only from our own traumas, but from intergenerational, transgenerational, systemic, and collective trauma. It is especially striking that the province where some of the country's most traumatic events have occurred is also the province with some of the fewest supports for trauma treatment, recovery, and related preventative care. Public health researchers and social work advocates have sought to raise attention to the need for a province-wide strategy around grief and trauma. The failure to support people who, support, who experience grief and trauma is a central factor 
in the exacerbation of mental health suffering that leads to mental health crises and that also require additional funding and supports. Sadly, our government spending on mental health services is not even remotely close to the Canadian Mental Health Association's recommendation that at least 12% of the health budget be dedicated to mental health, with half that amount specifically for community-based care. I think that it should be closer to 50% because mental health and physical health should be the same, but that's me personally. You should think about what you think and contact your MLA. Almost all of us know someone struggling with depression, anxiety, or who has tried unsuccessfully to access mental health counseling or support. We need a coordinated approach to integrating services that reflect public health recommendations, focusing upon prevention. We need community-based, low barrier to access, trauma-informed, culturally safe healthcare that integrates mental health, dental care, social, economic support, biomedical care, spiritual care, we need all of this and more. We need trauma-informed policies, trauma-specific counseling, funded and accessible. We need to immediately act to reduce the harm of our current processes and policies, contribute to the plague of untreated trauma that festers into domestic violence and explodes in our communities and public spaces demanding to be seen. As we deal with the many recommendations of the Mass Casualty Commission's final report, let us not be overwhelmed by its length, but recognize that there is so much to do that we must begin now and invest heavily. Our collective safety and well being depend upon it. This is part of a much broader, necessary commitment to decolonizing and reconciliation, as colonialism is responsible for most of our social ills from racism to queer phobia, social and economic inequality climate injustice, food insecurity, PTSD from the experience of colonizing wars abroad and the deep trauma at the heart of our welfare system, so-called welfare system. There's so much more that needs to be done to align our budget, our policies and our practices with the recommendations of the growing number of reports commissioned to help us emerge from our violent past with a hope for a healthier future. Thank you for reading our letter. We are writing and sharing so many other letters that we shared with us because of our deep commitment to ensuring the public health and safety of all people in Mi'kmaq, Nova Scotia, to invite conversation on the harms that this practice causes and to recommit ourselves as a community to doing what we can to becoming a trauma-informed society that prioritizes the well-being of all residents and visitors. We have partnered with the Canadian Mental Health Association, as well as a growing coalition of healthcare providers who share our concern and are hopefully going to sign on to this letter. We would like to meet with you jointly in order to partner with you to, in saving our healthcare system and preventing harm to the most vulnerable and marginalized. We appreciate the role of consultants, but would like to request that public health experts, healthcare providers, and those with first voice experience be the ones to lead conversations about public health and collective safety. We believe that a true collaborative partnership with our elected leaders would mean that the healthcare providers that will deliver care to everyone in this province be consulted in a coordinated and collective manner so that we can join you in discerning the best ways to optimize the health and well being of all Nova Scotians. May this letter prompt an opportunity to begin a regular quarterly dialogue with you on these topics as an expression of our shared commitment to truth, reconciliation, and the safety of everyone, healthcare provider and resident who dwells in unceded Mi'kmaq. And that is our vision for today. We will continue after lunch with more letters that'll be written and shared by first voice speakers as well as social workers 